Um, thank you very much for inviting me. It's wonderful to be back here at the Graduate Centre. I've been here a few times now, and I must say it's always a thrill to come to a, a university. It's right smack down in the middle of Manhattan. I still can't get over it. Um, and it's great to participate in this, this speaker series. Um, and I, you know, I've had a lot of uh, mentors from this place, including Carol and also Virginia Held, who um, has also been great to me throughout my career. So, so it's kind of a special place. Um, so, uh, I'm, I'm going to do an introduction to my introduction, and then I'll do my talk. So, my my introduction to my introduction is just to say that I'm going to be talking about something called feminist foreign policy, um, and. You know, you may not even be aware that that's a thing. Um, it's primarily a thing in two countries, Sweden and Canada. Uh, and believe it or not, I'm actually going to be a little bit critical of the way that it has been framed by those countries, by the way it's been framed and enacted, uh, both by political and policy figures on one hand and in the small but growing academic literature uh, on the other. And as I said to Carol when we were up in her office before I came down here, I must say that I realize that this might be a little hard to take for you, this audience, in, in this country. Um, if, insofar as I'm sort of criticizing um, the idea of feminist foreign policy as not being good enough at its feminism. Um, because I, I know that the situation here is a little different. Um, and you might be just jumping for joy if suddenly you had a feminist foreign policy. Um, so I understand that that might seem a little galling. Um, but I, I just would say two things to that. Um, first, I would say that the current period in which we are existing, um, the period of Trump in this country, uh, Brexit in the UK, populism in Europe, um, I see that as representing not so much a break from liberal internationalism, towards a new era of hierarchy in the West, but rather a fulfilling of the promises, if you will, of those neoliberal economic policies and techniques of governance that we saw beforehand. So in other words, words while what is happening now seems really, really bad for women and feminism, um, I would say that what was there before was not necessarily all that much better. It's just that we're kind of, it's sort of hitting us in the face now. And second, uh, while it could be argued that neoliberalism was quite successful at co-opting feminism, you know, when I think of things like the union and that kind of feminism, um, overtly sexist modes of governing, like Donald Trump's, give rise to resistance. And so as feminists, myself, I think of myself as a feminist, we have a responsibility to get it right if we're going to do things like feminist policy making. Um, to ensure that our brand of feminism doesn't reproduce the same hierarchies and modes of exclusion that we are claiming to challenge. Um, so that's my introduction to my introduction, uh, explaining why I think it's necessary to think critically about the framing and enacting of feminist foreign policy. I should also say that I'm going to be talking about Saudi Arabia today, and when, again, when I was writing this, uh, the original version of this paper quite some time ago, I had no idea how quite how topical Saudi Arabia was going to be. So hopefully we can have some good conversation with uh, the talk. So to begin um, my introduction, um, in 2014, uh, Sweden became the first state ever to adopt publicly a feminist foreign policy with a stated ambition to become the, quote, strongest voice for gender equality and full employment of human rights for all women and girls. In Canada, the Liberal government of Justin Trudeau has followed this lead announcing a feminist international assistance policy in 2017, referring explicitly to their foreign policy as feminist in key foreign policy speeches and documents. So as a result of this move from the House of Sweden in Canada, there's been a spark of academic interest in feminist foreign policy over the past two years. Now prior to around 2015, there was certainly significant critical feminist work in the field of international relations, specifically addressing gender in foreign policy from a feminist perspective. So that literature was there. But it's only since around 2017, responding to these developments in the world, that scholars have become increasingly interested <coughs> in analyzing the meaning and implications of foreign policy that is explicitly named feminist. So my paper begins by tracing the development of feminist foreign policy in Sweden and in Canada. 
Um, and I use the diplomatic crises with Saudi Arabia faced by both countries as illustrative examples. It then addresses the discursive positioning of feminist foreign policy as ethical foreign policy uh, and, and the implications of this for both feminism and for ethics. Feminist foreign policy is currently in both countries framed and enacted, as I said, in both political and academic discourse through the universalist moral language of human rights and liberal internationalist understandings of global justice. I argue in the paper, however, that what will make feminist foreign policy ethical is not its adherence to universal moral principles, but its ability to reveal the epistemic and material violence that is inflicted through constitutive gender binaries. Positioning the ethics of universal global justice as feminine or even feminist is unsustainable, I argue, since it reinforces a series of gender binaries that constitute the international foreign policy and even the ethical. As Charlotte Hooper has argued, masculinity is an incredibly resilient concept in terms of how it legitimizes the behavior of both male and female actors. Masculinity, she argues, appears to have no stable ingredients, and therefore its power depends entirely on certain qualities being associated with men. On this view, what is required is an approach to ethic that, ethics that does not rely on gender binaries, but instead has the resources to challenge them. So I'm going to suggest that. Uh, part three, then, of the paper sketches out a critical feminist ethics of care as a basis for an ethical feminist <coughs> care ethics now includes a wide range of literature and a diverse uh, array of disciplines, including work now in international relations. While there are a number of key authors who are widely recognized as the central figures in care ethics, uh, my reading relies here in this paper specifically on the work of Carol Gilligan on moral psychology, ethics, and more recently her work on politics. In contrast with much of the very valuable research which focuses on the concept of care and its application to women's labor, social policy, migration, etc., Gilligan's approach focuses on the epistemic, psychological, and political structures of Western patriarchy. The approach is committing, committed to revealing the harms caused by absolutist, dualistic categories of all kinds and emphasizes the relationality of moral agents as well as the importance of con contextual and revisable moral judgment. A feminist ethic of care emphasizes careful attention and attentive listening to the needs and perspectives of others. It understands all people as embodied, vulnerable, and mutually interdependent. The view that these conditions are simply the pathologies of some, the weak, the not fully mature, the feminine, is a function of a dominant rationalist form of patriarchy, which divides the self and separates themselves from others. So I'm, I'm relying on Gilligan there for, for that. Uh, insofar as it is committed to disrupting the binary logics of Western patriarchy, it could be argued that a care ethics perspective challenges not only a particular view of foreign policy, but the very idea of foreign policy itself. So you know, I realize that if I take these arguments to their logical conclusion, there, there's no such thing as foreign po policy, or at least we have to disrupt that as well. So I am very sympathetic to that, and maybe I will write another paper, but I'm not pursuing that here. And partly I think it's because I see that there is some diverse <coughs> political and ethical momentum behind the idea of feminist foreign policy. You know, it may be a little hard to see from here, but you know, there is a center for feminist foreign policy in the UK, they produce a journal. You know, I mean, it's small, but there's some, some momentum. Um, and I think it's emerging at a time when the need for feminist mobilization against the forces of patriarchy and populism uh, is quite urgent. I think feminist foreign policy is an idea that can be mobilized strategically and can be tied to an understanding of ethics. Uh, but as I said, what makes a feminist foreign policy ethical is not its commitment to acting decisively and with epistemological certainty on already agreed upon rational principles of rights and justice that conform to the already existing liberal international order Rather, ethical foreign policy that is feminist, as I said already, is about revealing the ways in which actors in global politics are constituted and sustained through relationships in specific times and places, and tracing how power in its various forms makes those relationships oppressive or unable. Okay, so that was the introduction.
So now I'm going to go back and, and uh, give you a very abbreviated look at what is feminist foreign policy. In the written version of the paper, I have much more uh, empirical sort of stuff here, but I, I'm going to um, condense it down a bit. So uh, in terms of starting with Sweden, when the Swedish uh, Social Democratic Party and Green Party formed a coalition government after the 2014 elections, they called themselves the world's first feminist government. So it's not just for policy, right? It's all aspects of governing and policy making in Sweden that are described as feminist. Uh, but I feel like it's the foreign policy, right, that's got the most attention. Um, uh, the, so the world's first feminist government, and, and since then they have intensified Sweden's domestic gender mainstreaming. In October of the same year, Sweden became the first nation state ever to adopt a feminist foreign policy. According to Swedish Foreign Minister Margo Wallström, Sweden's feminist foreign policy is about systematically and holistically implementing policies that contribute to gender equality and the full enjoyment of human rights of all women and girls. This is achieved through a focus on the so-called three R's, rights, representation, and resources. Sweden has now produced a comprehensive handbook on feminist foreign policy detailing their policies in a range of sub-areas of foreign policy, including peace and security, trade, and international development. Canada, under the Liberal government of Justin Trudeau, has become the second country to make an explicit commitment to feminism in both domestic and foreign policy. I don't know if it made news here or not, but Trudeau famously began his work as Prime Minister by forming Canada's first ever gender-balanced cabinet, uh, which includes figures like the Honorable Joni Wilson-Raybould, who is Canada's first ever female First Nations Minister of Justice and Attorney General of Canada. Uh, and later, after a little shuffle, uh, another woman, the Honorable Christian Freeland, uh, who is the Minister of Foreign Affairs, who I think probably made some news here with the new NAFTA negotiations, which uh, just finished up. Trudeau himself is a self-described feminist. Uh, which seems to have provoked equal measures of delight and disdain uh, from observers both in Canada and around the world. Oh, yes, stand up comedy here. <laughs> oh, right. Oh, no, I, well, <laughs> just kidding. Okay. Um, He'll edit that. So, uh, in terms of, of foreign policy, the key document so far in Canada is the feminist international assistance policy. Uh, so international development announced in June 2017. But we hear a lot about, we, so that's really the only feminist policy that's emerged, but we certainly hear a lot about feminism in foreign policy speeches. Uh, in 2018, Christian Freeland stated that women's rights are human rights and they are at the core of our foreign policy, which is why she continued, we are committed to an ambitious feminist It is clear that for both countries, feminist foreign policy is discursively constructed as ethical. As Wallstrom noticed, noted in a speech to the United States Institute of Peace, feminist foreign policy seeks the same goals as any visionary foreign policy. Peace, justice, human rights, and human development. It simply acknowledges that we won't get there without adjusting existing policies down to their nuts and bolts to correct the particular and often invisible discrimination exclusion and violence still inflicted on the female half of us. Thus, and that's end quote. So thus women and the feminine, as I read it, are positioned as the key to the re realization of ethical or visionary foreign policy goals, peace, justice, human rights, and human development. Uh, academics Karen Agustem and Annika Bergman Rosamond support this view in their 2016 article in the journal Ethics and International Affairs, in which they write that the declaration of a distinct feminist foreign policy signals a departure from the elite-oriented feminist sorry, foreign policy practices and discourses towards a policy framework that is guided by normative and ethical principles. So these authors rely on what they call, or they rely on, they didn't call it that, uh, the solidarist branch of the English school, which is an approach to international relations theory, to conceptualize efforts to pursue an ethically informed foreign policy. They argue that the relevant credentials of this approach are based on its provision of a, quote, progressive account of global relations and for normative consideration in global politics, because it takes account of states' endeavors to overcome the constraints of anarchy in a fashion conducive to both international order and justice. 
Despite its status as an ethical IR theory, the authors in this paper note that the English school is entirely void of feminist insights about the gendered lives and stories of women in international society. Um, their aim, then, is to insert gender, in some way, uh, into this English school framework so that it can serve as an ethical foundation on which to build a feminist foreign policy. The English school of IR theory offers a critique of realism. Against neo-realism, English school argues that there is a society of states at the international level and that the relations among states, including ideational relations of an historical or legal nature, um, shapes conduct in international politics. The English school is generally understood to have two branches, a pluralist branch and a solidarist branch. The former uh, argues that given the diversity in the world, a pluralist, tolerant, difference-preserving international society is the best that we can hope for. By contrast, the solidarist branch follow Kant to argue for the possibility and desirability of a cosmopolitan global order guided by the principles and practices of international human rights and humanitarian intervention. And so this is the framework that the authors use to argue in favor of this foreign policy. To my mind, you know, I, when I read that, I thought, well, how does this approach really fare as an ethical basis for a feminist foreign policy? And to me, most glaring is the blindness of this approach to our theory um, to the constitutive and causal effects of gender in international politics. And the authors even note that, but decide to press on that. Um, they, on their view, I think the merits of this approach lie in its liberal cosmopolitan underpinning which can support what the authors describe as the broad cosmopolitan underpinnings of the feminist foreign policy. They cite feminist international ethicist Kim Hutchings, who explains that in a textbook chapter, uh, feminist justice ethicists seek to make the universal terms of traditional moral theory genuinely inclusive and universal. But I think the authors are taking something she said and confusing it with something that is actually her own argument, because. Uh, as Hutchings' very extensive corpus of work critiquing moral rationalism, including feminist justice ethics, shows rationalist international ethical and political theory works because it tells us, where us being the white liberal citizens of Western states, so much of what we already know about moral agency and situations. What it accomplishes is to institutionalize hierarchical relations and patterns of inclusion and exclusion in the practice of ethics. The discursive and normative positioning of feminist foreign policy as ethical foreign policy is not really a difficult move to make. Gender binaries are constitutive of the language and practices of international politics. So I've just argued that it's, international politics is right with the gender binaries. Um, for example, realpolitik and realist foreign policy, state-centric and self-interested, are in large part constituted through their masculine gendering. Because of the pervasiveness of gender binaries in Western thought, any association of foreign policy with morality or ethics is regularly, whether or not explicitly labeled feminist, regularly constructed as feminine. Right? The ethical, the soft, as opposed to the hard, real politique. Um, paradoxically, however, at a different level, even ostensibly ethical foreign policy that elevates the importance of human rights, for example, over trade, or which subordinates direct material gains to the need to save strangers caught in humanitarian emergencies, even that is regularly constructed discursively through a kind of protective paternal masculinity. Thus, feminist foreign policy is itself constituted by the gender binaries that likewise construct foreign policy itself. While it is ethical and soft, and hence gendered feminine, it is sim simultaneously protective and paternal, and hence gendered masculine. These constructions, uh, I would argue, are not essential or fixed, but rather fluid and open to rewriting and reenactment. Sweden and Canada stand by the belief that as feminist and ethical govern governments, they must be required to pass judgment on the unethical or barbaric acts of other states to condemn, criticize, or rebuke any policy or regime that appears to contradict their own commitment to justice and human rights. This emerged clearly in the diplomatic crises with Saudi Arabia, faced by Sweden in 2015, and more recently with Canada uh, in 2018 this year. 
Um, in February of 2015, Foreign Minister Wallström, speaking before the Swedish Parliament, criticized Saudi Arabia's human rights record. Specifically, she criticized the public flogging of the blogger Ray Badawi and later described it as medieval. Wallström, whose government recognized the state of Palestine in 2014, had been asked to deliver a speech at, at an Arab League summit in Cairo in late March. But Saudi Arabia intervened, and Wallström was disinvited. On March 9th, Saudi Arabia withdrew its ambassador to Sweden, saying that Wallström had unacceptably inter interfered in the country's internal affairs. <coughs> the United Arab Emirates followed a uh, suit a week later, and Wallström was also condemned by the Gulf Cooperation Council, uh, and the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, which includes 57 countries, uh, and the Arab League itself. Now, complicating these matters is the fact that Sweden is one of Europe's largest per capita arms exporters. The day after Wallström was supposed to have appeared in Cairo on March 10th, the government announced its decision not to renew a bilateral arms agreement with Saudi Arabia. This has been described as Wallström's feminist foreign policy in practice. Not surprisingly, the move did not sit well with some of Sweden's most powerful industrialists who stood to lose significant income from a break in relations with the Saudis. In an effort to reduce tensions and mitigate damage, one week later, a delegation of Swedish officials traveled to Riyadh, carrying letters from Prime Minister Stefan Löfven and the Swedish king, explaining that Wallström had not intended to criticize Islam and offering official regrets for the misunderstanding. The Saudi ambassador to Sweden is now reinstated. As Jenny Nordberg described, uh, describes in The New Yorker, Wallström's political opponents came down hard on what they saw as a clumsy performance. Still, the Swedish, feminist, uh, the Swedish foreign minister refused to back down, referring only to a misunderstanding and stressing that no apology for her specific remarks had been or would be made. The diplomatic crisis with Canada was actually more severe, and at the time of writing, and now actually, is still ongoing. On August 1st of this year, Amnesty International announced that the Saudi government had arrested several female activists. One of these women was uh, the Saudi activist Samar Badawi, who is in fact the sister of Rafe Badawi, the activist at the heart of the Swedish affair, who had been has been detained since 2012. Rafe Badawi's wife and children were made Canadian citizens in 2018. On August 2nd, Christian Freeland tweeted, or tweeting, foreign policy by tweet, um, that she was very alarmed to learn of the arrest and that Canada stands together with the Badawi family. The next day, Canada's foreign ministry weighed in, writing on Twitter that Saudi Arabia should immediately release Badawi and uh, all other peaceful human rights activists. On August 5th, in a string of 10 tweets, Saudi Arabia accused Canada of an overt and blatant interference in the internal affairs of the kingdom and said its tweet broke broke with the most basic international norms of diplomacy. Within hours, the Canadian ambassador was expelled, and it was announced that Saudi Arabia uh, would be suspending all new trade investment um, with Canada. They also threatened to uh, bring home all students studying, foreign, the Saudi students studying Canada. Uh, they studied at all levels of the university, but I understand that that didn't happen. So many have applauded Sweden and Canada for taking an ethical stand on the policies of Saudi Arabia. Some are more cynical, pointing out the inconsistencies between Canada's rhetoric on Twitter and elsewhere on women's rights and the continuation of trade relations with the kingdom. Arms deals have proven to be a special thorn in the side of feminist governments, as they have in the past for all governments in which leaders simultaneously support progressive foreign policy goals and export-oriented defense industries. And that's actually like quite a lot. That's happened often. Indeed, this is the conundrum of the post-Cold War liberal international order, where good governance is oriented towards both individual, and here I mean civil and political rights, and the opening of markets and the liberalization of trade. But the tension is particularly acute for feminist governments, given the potential for arms to be used to perpetuate gender-based violence. Uh, indeed, as, as has been argued in another article, if the Canadian government truly wishes to help build gender equitable societies around the world, then a good place to start would be the mixing of massive arms sales to countries with lousy records on women's rights. In 
response to the increasingly evident human costs of the regulated asset global tra trade in arms, the UN Arms Trade Treaty was adopted by the General Assembly in 2013 and came into force in December 2014. In addition to obligating states to prevent uh, the export of arms to another country, the transfer would be contrary to an arms embargo, other international law, or if the item would be used in the commission of genocide, crimes against humanity, grave breaches of the Geneva Convention, states were expressly required to take into account serious violations of gender-based violence or acts of violence against women in making their assessment. While many in the international community applaud the ATT, others are more skeptical. Uh, problems of implementation, a lack of transparency, lack of enforcement, and the general weakness of the treaty itself are often cited. Worse than this, however, is the possibility that the whole premise of the treaty is fatally flawed. Specifically, the basic premise that only some weapons are bad and others are either neutral or possibly even good. Thus, paradoxically, the ATT could actually be used to justify increases in arms sales if adequate evidence that weapons are being used in the right way is provided. Once this is understood, it becomes clear that a key effect of the ATT could be the legitimation of liberal forms of militarism exercised by major Western states. In seeking to distinguish between moral and immoral weaponry, we fail to recognize the wider structural effects of militarism. As Paul Kirby has put it, is there ever a conflict where arms flows could not be said to facilitate serious acts of gender-based violence, harms strongly correlated with, but not necessarily inflicted by, the deployment of weaponry? Because the ATT seeks to judge the ethical nature of individual arms deals, it ultimately offers the possibility of justifying particular deals if they are deemed legitimate. Much like just war theory, which can be used to justify ethical warfare, the ATT diverts our attention from the structural nature of militarism and the complex relationship between the structures and institutions of global capitalism, the transnational structures of racism, and the liberal international order. Rather than pitting a feminist foreign policy as a pre-formed set of moral principles against arms deals, immoral self-interest policies on the part of states, Feminist governments should interrogate the role of states, including their own, in supporting liberal militarism and thereby contributing to its gender defense. I believe that the tweets and pronouncements of the Canadian and Swedish governments on Saudi Arabia were misguided. The neglect of context and relational positioning, as well as the hubris of certainty and moral necessity, were in conflict with the methods and aims of feminist ethics. To assert the backwardness and morally corrupt nature of Saudi Arabia is to ignore the long history of Western state involvement in that country. Although not, under, uh, 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 not through a relation of formal colonialism, first Britain and then the United States and other countries have long supplied the country with arms in return for their strategic allegiance in the region. It is also to position Canada and Sweden as superior enlightened nations that treat their women properly. This kind of framing contributes to the erasure of Saudi women's agency. As Victoria Keith argues in relation to the Swedish case, it is crucial for Sweden to understand the complicated and nuanced situation of women within the kingdom and recognize the indigenous women's rights movements and the renegotiations of gender power relations that currently exist without Sweden or Canada. Blindness to this context and to the agency and diversity of women within Saudi Arabia reveals both, both racist logics and a tendency towards culture blaming that depoliticizes social and economic problems and diverts attention away from the ways in which uh, practices are supported and sustained by the structure of the global economy and transnational strategic and security interests. To imagine culture as an isolated realm of values and practices separate from other kinds of social relations is inevitably to reproduce the dichotomies of us and them, uh, and is blind to both historical and current relationships, and it will hinder our ability to craft a foreign policy that helps to create the conditions for long-term transformation in gender relations. Ethical stances which pit barbaric culture, cultures against enlightened Western morality are thick with neocolonial logics and racial hierarchies that perpetuate rather than transform global inequalities. <coughs> Rather than pitting culture against women's human rights, a feminist ethic of care would situate practices and traditions in a broader relational, geopolitical, political, and geoeconomic context. As Alison Jagger argues, topics on the agenda of intercultural dialogue about global justice for women and men in non-Western countries 
must be questions about the basic structure of the global political economy, as well as the economic policies of those Western governments that directly, indirectly, affect poor women's lives. My argument here should not be under, misunderstood as a defense of the Saudi regime or of their practices. Indeed, the most recent developments regarding the disappearance of journalist Jamal Khashoggi demonstrate the blatant funding of the most basic individual and political freedoms uh, and rights by that country. And yet, as we are quick to denounce, Western states should look towards their own human rights record and their complicity in perpetuating the colonial legacies which fuel racism. In a recent article on racism, nationalism, and feminism in Sweden, Manja Sagra and Diana Molinari use the concept of hegemonic feminism to describe a form of feminism framed by the traditions of Western feminism, powerfully located within the privileges of whiteness and fundamental to the creation of the category of migrant women in need of rescue from violent patriarchies located outside of Swedish national boundaries. Wallstrom's mistake, I think, was not uh, the withdrawal from the arms agreement. I think that was okay, although I'm not sure what it accomplishes, that single withdrawal. Uh, but I think her mistake was the framing of this move within a wider criti critique of the medieval and barbaric practices of non-Western non-liberal societies, and by tying this to a general appeal to ethics and justice. Likewise, Freeland's demand for the immediate release of political detainees in Saudi Arabia demonstrates a selectivity and targeting that uses moral judgment as punishment and which invites charges of hypocrisy. As a result, these actions, while seemingly progressive and ethical, are unlikely to be transformative in the direction of long-term feminist goals. And I don't know how much time I have left, probably not that long. Um, I am was hoping to continue, okay, to talk about the ethics of care as a more potentially more transformative approach, um, which could use the whole the global arms trade to highlight a series of gender relations of power that weave together uh, the global arms trade, transnational business interests, liberal militarism, systemic transnational racism, neocolonialism, and the structural causes of women's oppression around the globe. So, I have five minutes to talk about the ethics of care. Um, okay, so, I'll take that. Thank you. Um, I, I, in my reading of care, and the way I describe it in this paper, again, I talk not so much about the concept of care elaborated by people, say, like John Toronto, who you may have read, um, but again, I'm relying more on Gilligan's idea of, of and especially in her more recent book, work, on care, um, the voice of care is a voice of resistance, resistance to the logic of hierarchy and separation, um, and uh, the, the binaries, the sort of Cartesian binaries that um, that are rampant in Western societies. Um, I have three attributes that I think are important: relationality, contextualism, and revisability. I'll try and say just a little bit about each one. Um, uh, okay, I'm just trying to. So, relationality is a key feature in ethics of care. Uh, sometimes care ethicists talk about a relational ontology as the basis of care, uh, or of the subject as existing in relation with others. Um, in particular, feminist care ethicists argue that moral ontology and subjective subjectivity are fundamentally relational that the subject emerges through relations with others. Um, this is not a static concept or set of principles, but is a way of seeing the world that addresses not only ontology, but also epistemology. Thus, knowledge is also understood relationally. We must ask who makes the knowledge claims and from what vantage point uh, and when what to of power. The relational self does not conform to the model of the Cartesian subject. Um, the fact that uh, in empirical observations, women display characteristics of the relational self is not to say that women's authentic selves are relational, but somehow essentialist, and it, nor does it imply that women's moral development uh, is uniform. Identities are formed through important experiences related to race, class, and geopolitical uh, location. 
no, and it also doesn't mean that we only have moral obligations to those with whom we have relationships, right? Often people think that the ethics of care is about mothers and children or, or close family relations. But again, ref, uh, relying on pool, it refers to a resistance to the culture of separation and detachment that defines hierarchical systems of power. Uh, so closely related to relationality is the idea of context, an ethic of care is skeptical of universalizable moral principles that can be applied across time and space. By contrast, it demands attention to context, to the particularities of social location, historical background, structural conditions, and relationships between relevant moral actors. Um, in this sense, it is opposed to the logic of traditional law theory, which demands abstraction from context in order to gain objectivity. Um, okay. And then finally, I'm skipping here, revisability refers to the requirement of epistemological humility, the need to embrace uncertainty and recognize that there are only better or worse forces of action at any given time and in any context. You may know that Carol Gilligan interviewed uh, a lot of um, girls and women, boys and men, in her early book, In a Different Voice. One of her subjects was called Amy in the book. When Amy, one of Gillian's subjects, responds to a question posed regarding an abstract dilemma, she says, well, it depends. That's her answer. As Gilligan explains, when this is considered in the light of traditional definitions of the stages and sequences of moral development, her judgments appear to be at a low level of moral maturity. They reveal an inability to think systematically about the concepts of morality or law, or a reluctance to examine the logic of received moral truth. But from the perspective of an ethics of care, Amy's reluctance to make universalized judgment stems from a heightened perception of the role of context and the nature of relationship in moral judgment. It is this willingness, I think, to live with uncertainty that defines feminist care ethics as critical, um, and that can allow feminism, I think, to be potentially transformative in the long run. As Kim Hutchings argues, critique is premised on the impossibility of a definitive answer to the conditions of its own possibility, and can only content itself with the acknowledgement of the revisability of any grounds on which its specific claims are based. The implication of this is that we must let go of the idea, I think, of feminist foreign policy as a principle of foreign policy. Principles have an unmistakable allure. They work very well when we take what Raymond Goyce calls an ethics-first approach to politics, where we attain an ideal theory of how we should act, and then in the second step, apply the ideal theory to the action. But the dominance of this kind of thinking in the realm of ethical foreign policy has led to a hyper-rationalist approach to the suffering of the peoples of the world, where useful knowledge is blinded to contingency, context, embodiment, and emotion. So I do have a conclusion but I think maybe if I reach my conclusion for um, two more minutes from the standpoint of the ethics of care, <laughs> revising all the things. Go on. Okay. Um, where should I go? Um, okay. So what I'm trying to argue, then maybe if I just sum up, um, I think a feminist foreign policy can be and seen as an ethical foreign policy. But as I've said, not where ethics is understood as you know, the way we've been talking about ethics uh, in foreign policy and principled foreign policy um, since the end of the Cold War, say. Uh, I've argued that this is that the equating feminist foreign policy with that is damaging for feminism in two ways. First, it reifies the gendered binaries between the real and the ideal in international <laughs> politics. Uh, gendering the ethical in this way means that it will always be played off the masculine, real world of self-interest, and destined to be dismissed as soft and feminine. Second, it fails to recognize the ways in which this approach to ethics is itself constituted through a patriarchal binary which associates masculinity with universality and objectivity, silencing alternatives or dismissing them as immature, particularistic, or relativist. On this binary, global justice is enacted by a series of powerful Western states for the benefit of racialized others. Not only is this narrative partial and inadequate, but it serves to both produce and reinforce relations of domination. And I just would also like to say that despite the everyday meaning of the word care, I was just at a conference, the first annual Care Ethics Research Consortium Conference. 
Um, and we talked a lot about the word care and care ethics and <coughs> what that's done for care ethics. Not all of it good. Um, so anyway, despite the everyday meaning of the word care, care ethics does not prescribe caring for those who are less fortunate or less enlightened than us. On the contrary, care ethics describes a form of moral responsiveness that is curious about context and sees moral dilemmas and difference through the prism of relationship. It is skeptical of preformed right answers about how to act in cases of competing moral demands, and instead accepts the inescapability of our mutual vulnerability, our problems, our ways of knowing. It doesn't resist Western patriarchy in order to legitimate other forms of patriarchy, as in a country like Saudi Arabia, or other non-Western systems of domination, but encourages resistance to all hierarchical systems of knowledge and forms of governance. Finally, it is, I think, a democratic ethic that presumes relational subjects engaging in ongoing participation in civic life as both givers and receivers of care. And that's a quote from John Toronto's most recent book. As Gilligan and Snyder explain in their upcoming book, patriarchy requires the sacrifice of human connection. Democracy, however, however is contingent upon relationship and on everyone having a voice that is grounded in their own experience. So I'll, I'll just leave it there and then hopefully you can have some discussion. Agency 
right, to, to others. Um, and that's why, you know, it recognizes the yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, you know, I, I don't know if anyone's going to ask this, but if I were in the audience listening to me, I would ask, so how are you going to actually translate that into policy? You know, what kind of policies are going to come out of an ethics of care? <coughs> You know, I, I, any suggestions would be great. So, <laughs> just a question. Maybe she'll answer it. Uh, no, I just had a, a question for you. Um, so, could you maybe <coughs> supplement or expand on the argument that um, a feminist foreign policy, at, framed as an ethical foreign policy, uh, would be feminine and therefore reinforcing a binary between masculinity and femininity? Because uh, you know, just a policy being ethical, I just don't see how that would be feminine when, you know, so much of history, like ethics and justice, were considered to be the work of men. And, well, I mean, that's why women were excluded from voting for so long, because women were regarded, they didn't have the capacity to yeah. be able to do this critical thinking and make these ethical decisions. So, so yeah, that. well, I, I've got a kind of like, crazy argument there, I, maybe you didn't pick up on it, because I was trying to say that it's kind of both, right? It's kind of, it's the, the, the gender binaries are all over the place here, because I, I do think, you know, in, in international relations, certainly, in that discipline, we do gender the ethical, the, the human rights, the, uh, you know, as, as feminine, as compared to realism, Right, the sort of state-centric, self-interested view of the world, which we tend to see as very masculine. Um, so I, I do think in, in, in the human rights world, they tend to do that? Is that what you said? In, in, in IR, international, international oh, relations, okay. right, and, um, in that sort of discipline. But then I went on to say, and this just shows how fluid these things are, that, that within the kind of realm of ethics, uh, certainly, yes, justice, Rights. They have. They have a kind of almost paternalist masculinity um, because they're seen as, you know, what we have to enact to help the, the unenlightened or the those who require punishment or or educating in the rest of the world. Um, and, and care on the other side, right of the care justice debate is gender feminine, obviously. So I guess I was trying to to say that, that you know, there's not like these aren't essential categories, obviously. These aren't discursive categories that are up for grabs, and I, I take your meaning of, of, of that as well. Um, but I'm saying the whole thing is shot through with, with gender, right? And that, that this is going to be problematic if we, because I see the way they're, they're doing feminist foreign policy is buying into these binaries in one way or another, right? As opposed to trying to resist the, that, that binary kind of logic. Does that make sense? Susan, do you want to? Yeah, that's how, I mean, they're buying into the, the, that what they're doing is feminine and soft. I don't know if they are. I mean, I, I guess you could say some people could see it that way, but. Well, no, no I can. Canadian. Okay. <laughs> No, I'm not really, but you're just, we're there no, for a while. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, maybe buying into is the wrong word. And I, I wouldn't say, no, I wouldn't say that Christian Freeland or Margot Wallström thinks that what they're doing is feminine or something. No, I'm just saying that, that, that these logics are, are permeate the way we see the world, um, and the way, you know, everyone sees the world. Um, and I, I'm, I'm worried about the, uh, the you know, the, the, the Using the same kind of liberal internationalist uh, approach is going to be destined for failure because it's going to reproduce the the, the, the hierarchies that exist. And the gender binary. Right and the gender. Yeah. Okay. Right. So this ties into what you said. You figured that someone would ask this question, right? So care ethics tries to highlight the great relationality of human beings, I guess. It, it, but yeah. let's say at, at the minimum, at the minimum, let's say that, surely. Yeah. And then from there, we're led to condemn all, seems all hierarchy. Or at least that, that's what I got from, from your paper today. You're condemning hierarchy and, 
and binary logic, binary logics that are, that are I guess, are inherently hierarchical. Is that an assumption as well? I think so, yeah. So, I don't know where this happened last year. The question is, why is hierarchy bad? Something like that. That's a question a lot have. Is it is it a question built in, is it a question built into the ethics of, is it is it an assumption in the ethics of care that hierarchy is is morally bad is it moral wrong? Does that question? No, I mean I just then if she says yes, then you're going to accuse her of universalism. No, not at all. I just I just like you, I was left thinking so. Okay, so I I understand how. I mean, your analysis was great at pointing out the hypocrisy of these, you know, well-positioned Western powers who can who can just, as really a matter of PR, point at Saudi Arabia and say, "Oh, look at your crappy human rights record." I mean, that's obviously not going to accomplish any long-term goals. You yeah. know what I mean? But but philosophically, what's what kind of prescriptions, ethical prescriptions, are we are we getting here? Well, I mean, I, I think um, what Gilligan is getting at is that. <coughs> That the, the voice of care that she heard um, was a, uh, and it's not again. She heard it in, in women, but it's because women were more likely to resist the kind of logic of separation and detachment um, that was more fully formed in men. Um, for Gilligan, I think recognizing our relationship to the other as opposed to seeing the other as fundamentally separate from us and usually not just separate but opposed and existing in, usually in some kind of usually binaries are not just binary equal right there hierarchy um, is what perpetuates a lot of damage that's done in the world and I think the, the recognition of, of relation of relationships context uh, and a kind of um, fundamental uh, epistemic kind of uh, epistemic vulnerability gives rise to a new kind of ethics and I, I mean these are not just Carol Gilligan's ideas the, you see these ideas in a lot of, of feminist ethics um, you know, again, how it how it translates into policy, I'm not sure. But I think a key thing is to to stop, you know, what you were referring to. Stop pointing out what's bad done by <laughs> by other states, or you know, again, it's either it seems to be either about punishing, protecting, or educating those others that don't know how to treat their women properly. Um, and I think uh, that. There are, there are better ways of doing that just by, just by, rather than even through policy, just by revealing, right, the way in which uh, relationships are, are important and the way hierarchies are at work in creating these kinds of problems in the first place. Is that going to work today in Saudi Arabia? Just revealing? Well, you know, I don't know. Maybe it's not yes, our job to everything. Sorry, right? I mean, I'm not, how can I put this? Like, I'm not in favor of, you know, detaining and arrest. How could you be? I, I'm not. Uh, but I also feel like, you know, what, what about the war in Yemen? Like, what about the economic and social and the, the, the rights of those people? I mean, we tend to focus on these kind of high profile media um, friendly. Uh, situations, and, and and also we don't we don't like to admit our own culpability uh, in, in Western countries. That our his long history of creating the kind of order that we are now criticizing. And I know that's not a, a new argument, but I'm I'm just afraid. I see this thing called feminist foreign policy, and I think wow, that could actually be something that's really good. And I'm worried that it's going to reproduce you know what we had before um, and I'm just trying to grasp at a different way you know a kind of a different starting point um, for thinking about it ethically um, as opposed to 
and again, I don't know if I'm called human rights and cosmopolitanism in general, but I, but the, the way they're used discursively uh, can can I think sometimes be be damaging. So based upon what you were saying, you don't have a problem with human rights and cosmopolitanism what? more generally, conceptually. Do you think that a care ethics um, or foreign policy could be like an accretion upon like the traditional human rights framework, or does it have to be like a replacement of it? We kind of need to start uh, theorizing new ways of thinking about the norms that are undergirding our international relations. That's a good question. That's the that's the whole care justice debate maybe yeah. right there. Um, to the it's not here. Yeah. <laughs> she's giving um, a talk in Portugal. She was so sorry. Yeah. Is. So you know, I, I, I think, I think towards, I missed out a couple paragraphs where I say, you know, none of this is to get to say that the, the three R's of Swedish foreign policy, rights, representation, and resources, should just be like thrown out the window and we'll start again. I mean, I think that an ethics of care can work alongside those three basic things because I feel that that should be a part of all policy, rights, representation, and resources for women should be a part of all policy, domestic and foreign. But, but on the other hand, um, care ethics invites us to think differently about our relationship with others in a way that human rights just hasn't borne out that way politically. It just hasn't been used. It's, been, it's often been used politically to, to shame, to, you know, to be to, to justify uh, open markets and you know to justify our way of doing things etc cetera, etc cetera. so um, you know basic rights are legal rights uh, uh, those kinds of things are, are of great importance um, so that's a good question but I, I think they can work together eventually Alex? so I have uh, two questions that I discovered in my head are actually quite related First is, do you think it's possible for a government that is not doing feminist care policy at home, is it possible for them to enact feminist care foreign policy to, you know, let's say, a partial degree? And then the other question on top of that is, do you think it's possible for Within a foreign ministry or a, a, a um, state department here in the U.S., is it possible for there to be programs or leaders of divisions or districts of, of a foreign policy or of government that do care based feminist foreign policy, even if the whole uh, even if the whole isn't going in that direction? So the combination is. Can this be partial, mm -hmm. or do you do you get any care ethics at all in politics if you don't have one? Feeling like you might have a thought. <laughs> do you have a thought on it? Do you mind if I turn it around, or do you really? Are you really asking that as a Christian? I, oh, I'm, I'm interested. To I am. I'm really asking this, and I have okay. a personal say in this. My my wife works for. U.S. Department of State, right. and I think that she would be very much on board with the critique of feminist foreign policy as it exists now, right. and would very much like to yeah. do a more relational, more context, more right. sort, of, sort of collaborative, um, collaborative approach, like like Karen's approach. But she's not even the boss of her department. Yeah. Yet. But is this the sort of thing that you can't do? pieces or does it kind of fall apart to that kind of democracy that the liberal version does? Yeah. I don't know the answer. Let's be honest. I don't know. But it is very interesting to think about. I mean, um, in, in this country, I think you're facing an even bigger struggle, right, at this point in time. I, I can't even imagine what it's like for her to, to be in that job. It's got this face. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I think it's, it's hard, and I think I think Canada, you know, I think what's what we see now as a pushback against populism, we see a resurgence of, uh, you know, a doubling down, certainly by Canada, on, you know, the liberal, the rules-based international order. 
Um, and you know, I find myself kind of cheering, go, go, Christian, you know, when she's at the, uh, when she's speaking at the G7 and Charlotte, and, you know, but then I think, wait, this is what I was criticized for, <laughs> for its hypocrisy, for its, its hierarchical, right, the fact that it's, it, you know, it's a small subset of states that, anyway, I'm, I'm digressing, but I guess what I would say is that I feel like we need to, instead of looking back to the old order, <laughs> we need to push through in some way and see what comes out the other side. Um, and so, can you do anything? I mean, I think people who are actually on the ground working in development, um, who, uh, you know, um, for example, that's only one small part of foreign policy, but those working in development, I mean, now they have directives to do um, gender-based analysis and this kind of thing, which I think is important, but those kind of relationships that can be forged, the kind of pragmatism, contextualism, uh, you know, taking things case by case, that's probably where it can happen with a policy level. Right now. Can I also follow up then? Um, I'm uh, just in general, I'm really drawn to care ethics and care politics. One of the things that I worry about in implementation is this contextualized case by case thing. This seems a lot harder than rules to instantiate into institutions. Yeah. How, well do, uh, how well does this institutionalize? I want it to work. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there I, it's a good question. And it, you know, there's so many different, I, I, I've always, I, I think, tried to climb the highest mountain because I've tried to apply care ethics to international politics, which is like the hard, it's the like further part in people's minds, right? Care is like something else. Um, uh, uh, but there is a lot of work right on care in social policy and other forms of domestic policy, you know, and care more as a, care as a concept, right? Um, and, and actual, how can we uh, make, build societies where people have the time to be attentive and responsive to others? Because we do, often don't really have time to do that in, in the type of societies we have. Um, so, you know, maybe foreign policy is, uh, you know, I don't know, maybe I'll, this will just implode because I'll realize there are just too many contradictions. Um, no, no. <laughs> keep going. Keep going. Okay. Um, but uh, I think that, I think back to your first question, it probably has to be its way through all aspects of social, political, and economic life um, till, it, till it becomes just an obvious part of the way we live. And once it becomes that, then it would probably find its way into foreign policy. But one of the binaries I think that you know is problematic is this separation between domestic and foreign policy. Because you know, a critical eye of our scholars have been saying that for a long time. To talk about foreign policy as something we do to others, you know, it's like it doesn't make sense. Anyway, I appreciate the so you talk about the problem of feminist foreign policy taking a stance of us and them, like us in the civilized world and them in the barbaric world. Yeah. And it seems like a solution to that would be to um, view it as um, within a feminist understanding of patriarchy as a global system, yeah. uh, male supremacy as a global system of power and oppression. Right? Yeah. But you just said earlier, it was interesting, you, you said uh, that someone refers to patriarchy in the singular. Do you think it should be patriarchies? I was wondering if you could expand on that. Yeah. Uh, your idea, you think patriarchy should not be thought of as a global system of power, but that there are different systems of patriarchy? Well, uh, I don't know. I, I, like, I like that idea of patriarchy and male domination as a global system of power. I mean, when you, you know, that is quite convincing. I just feel that it, it takes different forms. It doesn't look the same in all places, in all times and places. <coughs> And so, you know, I'm worried about tarring it all with the same brush, right? To say that, because, I, and, and again, I mean, if I, if I am going to continue using Gilligan, she's pretty clear that she doesn't want to, to she's not defining patriarchy as movement. She's 
referring to it as this as this kind of uh, the, the, the the norms and values that that lead to separation, <laughs> right? Separation of us from others, and even a separation within a self. I mean, she's a psychologist. But right? you so see, it's so much the, the concept of phallocentrism used by like Lisa Rigorai and um, Judith Butler. And yeah. Again, I think Gilligan's view of it is, is a little different, but um, certainly related to those. I have a student who's trying to weave together Gilligan's feminism with French feminism, and you know, so I think there are there are certainly points of you know to, that we can bring together there. She, she, her, Gilligan's book, uh, Joining the Resistance, is the one that I rely on most, and she's got this new book coming out called Why Does Patriarchy Persist, which she has written. Uh, yeah, with a colleague in after the election of Trump, but it, you know, it's a, it's from a political scientist point of view, it's kind of like a low argument because it's she talks about love and uh, you know we, things that political scientists don't normally talk about. Um, but I think I find it very compelling. If I remember Amy correctly, she's concerned that application of rule-based systems lead to unjust outcomes. Because the application of those rules are not considered to be stuck with the way, nor are there alternatives. So if you're looking for better outcomes rather than just applications of rules, is there a series of danger that might be associated with that in the international context? Would, if it always depends, uh, would international relationships become even more perilous than they are today, where at least there are standards? that are taken that are supposed to be involved in, even if it's a bunch of bullshit and they're flying. But at least there's some kind of application. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of misunderstanding that led to World War I. Yeah. With like 20 states happening at once. Are we inviting more? No. What are the dangers that you see in an application if it's not done all at once? Yeah, you can't talk about it over the cheese No, it's a good question. I, but, but when you say, I mean, the problem is that the rules are, the rules, you know. Whether it's the Code of Hammurabi or the Constitution, I mean, sort of like it's a starting point, yeah. even if the application leads to unjust outcomes. Yeah. Without it, it's always it depends. I'm really worried. Oh, I, I, I don't think it's always it depends. Okay. Because that, that I mean, well, I, I wasn't. Well, I push the opposite. I, yeah, and when I said that she says it depends, I didn't mean to say like it's it. all relative, no, right? Which is great. often a thing. Um, but I think it depends means I don't, I can't say yet until I know more until about I these people. More, right. Put some flesh on the yeah. bones of these people. Right. Tell me about how they interact. Is it always one to see? Yeah, and then I'll talk. I'm not able to just say right or wrong based on some abstract. It's too hard for everybody. Yeah. So much work. I mean, but no, I think everybody's too lazy. Okay guys, let's go eat and drink and thank Yami.